talking about five D thermal surfaces. So before we get into the actual meat of the presentation, we have to start with one dimension down. Um, so first, there's two concepts you have to understand. One is like the mod P disk, which is essentially, you take a disk, you split the boundary into, two, into P equal parts, and you associate those parts that you split as follows. Basically, you just say they're all the same. So for example, if you have a point here, it's the exact same as this point, it's the exact same as this point. So if you were an ant, you tried to walk up here, you pop out either here or here. Um, those are two examples, the mod three and the mod six. Um, you just split into two parts. The other concept is uh, orienting boundaries mod three. Basically, what you need is at a vertex, there's a balance that equals zero mod three. So in this top case, you have three going in, three going out over there, so that's zero mod three. Down here, this does not work because you just have one going out, so that is not zero mod three. Yeah, so what I mostly focused on was looking at a specific case of the mod 3 disk, which is uh, spherical, so instead of it being flat, it's just the upper half of a sphere, as you can see here, and you associate the boundaries the exact same way. So in order to kind of better understand it, uh, one of the problems I spent a lot of time on was trying to figure out what the diameter of such an object would be, where diameter is defined as just the furthest two points can be on any part of the sphere. And so in order to do that, I considered a point uh, here, which is a distance B away from the boundary. And I tried to find a function of what the diameter would be as a function of B. So this is a triangle I ended up with after a lot of trial and error. <laughs> and basically, it gives me this relationship, which is just the spherical law of cosines. Uh, solving that for D in terms of B, you end up with this equation. And then in order to maximize it, I took the derivative. And, it, and I found the value of where um, the, de like the two points would be furthest away. And I, I, this is a complete answer because uh, it actually gives me what that value is as a function of what mod I'm looking at it. At it. So um, it's solely dependent on that. And then in order to find the actual diameter, you simply plug in this value into this equation. Um, yeah. Here's an example for P equals three, where you have the mod three spherical disk. Um, you plug it in, you get that. R cosine root four over seven, and you find that the diameter of the mod three spherical disk is this, which is not at all obvious. It's not like a simple thing, um, which I was surprised by because I thought it was going to be just like some easy value or some function of like pi, like pi over two, pi over three. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, transitioning over from uh, over to like minimal surfaces. Um, Recall that a minimal surface is given a prescribed boundary in three space. Um, it's the surface which is locally area minimizing, meaning any small change would only increase surface area. Um, and the only um, rotationally symmetric minimal surfaces are the catenoid and the plane, um, meaning that their surface is a revolution, and the catenoid is the surface of revolution of a curve called the catenary. Um, and similar to the mod three boundary canceling out in the cycles. If three things are oriented along a boundary, then we say that this has zero boundary along the singularity, mod three. And it's a rule about minimal surfaces that they can only meet three at a time at equal angles along singularities. Um, I was looking for mod three minimal surfaces of revolution, which would mean they'd have to be the union of catenoids and planes. Um, and one surface that immediately comes out um, is this one, where all of these planes are parallel, all of these angles are equal at 120 degrees. This can be extended infinitely, and um, it's not so interesting as an example. Um, so what I looked for after that was whether there's any surfaces like this, where there are no planes, everything's just a catenary. And they'd have to extend infinitely, only intersecting at 120. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, like it, we found um, what sort of triple intersections um, were okay, such that these catenaries wouldn't intersect again off screen. If they are, then the surface of revolution of them is a rotationally symmetric mod 3 minimal surface. So a question that came out of that is um, how far apart can the um, singularities be from each other? Like what's the maximum width between the leftmost and rightmost singularity? Can it be extended infinitely, like the example of the planes? Um, and coming up with a construction, um, essentially the question is, 
once you've reached a certain theta naught here, that this one makes below the horizontal. Notice that if theta naught is pi over 6, then in order for this to be 120 degrees, we have the plane example, and the furthest to the and it can be extended infinitely. Um, essentially, along each of these catenaries, you travel as far as you can before these two would intersect each other and then split off, leading to all of these being the same catenary. And essentially, the entire construction is determined from theta naught. And it turns out the maximum width is finite. It's something like that, <laughs> which is finite, but it's determined immediately just from theta naught. Um, and yeah, this is what it looks like. Varying theta naught, you can see as it gets closer to pi over 6, you're sort of approaching the plane example, and the width goes towards infinity. Um, but that construction doesn't account for different other sorts of intersections that can occur. Maybe you go up and branch off again. It turns out if you do do that, unless you create some sort of closed polygon of catenaries, um, everything, it won't work. But these sort of polygons do exist. These are all the symmet symmetric um, quadrilateral ones. So that the future direction is accounting for closed loops like this one. And that's, this is a GIF of that surface. All right, so uh, Ben talked about surfaces of revolution and catenoids. So now we're going to go into helical surfaces and helicats and helicoids. So we have catenoids and helicoids, and we can smoothly transform one to the other by that, with, as you can see in that animation, and I'm calling all the intermediate surfaces Hellcats for helicoid catenoid. Um, and that, so this is uh, parametrized by a function of t, and so you get a catenoid at t equals pi over 2 and a helicoid at t equals 0, and all these Hellcats in between. And so I thought, is there a t that, oh wait, I should mention, helicoids and catenoids don't self-intersect. These do. So I thought, is there a T that gives a 120 degree self-intersection because we're looking for 120 degrees? Um, the answer is yes, but first of all, we have to figure out which self-intersection we're talking about. You have any Hellcat, you get self-intersections right near the middle, and then, or you get some self-intersections and then more as you go out. So we are just looking at the innermost self-intersection and we're gonna cut off all the rest. Um, and we proved that that innermost intersection could form any angle between 0 and pi radians. So if you're very close to a catenoid, you get an angle that's almost 180 degrees. If you're very close to a helicoid, you get a very small angle, and that approaches 0, which we proved. So, based, so and they vary continuously, so due to the intermediate value theorem, we can get, oh, hold on, please. Uh, we can get a 120 degree angle. Um, this is an approximate picture of that. And then we can cut off the outside. Here's a surface, 120 degrees. And then we can wrap a flat helicoid around it to divide that outer angle in half. So we get 120, 120, and 120. And this is another minimal surface. However, there's a problem with this one. Uh, we talked about, then talked about orienting surfaces so that the boundary, um, so that all, so that the boundary was 0 mod 3, which basically means we have to orient all of these surfaces so that this boundary gets oriented the same way every time. But here we actually only have two surfaces, the purple one and the yellow one. It is not possible to orient those so that this becomes 0 mod 3. But we can fix that. If we, instead of just having one helicoid and one Hellcat, we have k of them. So this is k equal to four. We have four of these stacked up, four of these stacked up, and they all go around and around together. Um, and in this case, you can orient it to have zero boundary mod three for any even k, but not for odd k. So to summarize, there's a, there are countably, infinitely many of these um, that have this spiral symmetry, um, because you can have k equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. And for even k, you can also have the proper orientations. Um, and just, and yeah, these are 
complete and embedded in R3. They're minimal surfaces. And just to clarify, this is a theorem that proves that these exist. I don't currently have a formula to determine the value of t based on the value of k. But I know there is a value of t for every value of k. Sorry, um, what is t? I... t is the parameter that tells you what shape the Hellcat is, how close it is to a catenoid or how close it is to a helicoid. Okay. Um, the one potential, <laughs> the one potential application we have here is that this could form a pretty good shape for pasta. Um, the area of minimal pasta shapes is is like really lacking in in just just the pasta shapes available right now. Like we have some planes, and we have this somewhat helicoidal pasta, so this could be a good shape. The interesting thing about this somewhat helicoidal pasta is. The cross-section is three curves meeting at a point, which suggests another mod 3 minimal surface, which is again three helicoids meeting along, uh, meeting at 120 degrees. So yep, that's uh, helicoidal minimal surfaces. Um, as you have seen, my teammates have tried to find the minimal surfaces using a number of methods that they described. I, however, tried to use a different method, which is the wireframe method. Now, essentially, what I did was try to find solutions to Plateau's problem that would help me construct periodic Mach 3 minimal surfaces. Now, before I get to what that means, let's look at Plateau's problem. Plateau's problem states that it's a problem of finding a minimal surface with a given boundary contour. To look at that in a more practical way, as you can see here, we have wires and they form coast boundaries. Now if you take those two circular wires and you dip them into soap bubble, once you take them out, you will see that soap film has formed. And once it has formed, you will know that that surface is minimal. Here it represents the catenoid, the very minimal surface that Benny has been working with for a while. Um, but yes, uh, using this, I try to find some inspiration out in a mathematical word to see how I'm going to go about this. And the first thing that I did was try to find similar surfaces to what I was tr aiming to construct. Now you look, you look here, you see Schwartz's P surface and the Schwartz surface. If you look at the Schwartz's P surface, you see that it kind of like stacks up, um, at only like almost as if it's in a cube, which is almost what a trying to do here with um, the periodic surfaces. The shark surface also has that um, periodicity, except it's double, goes in three directions. Um, and I was very interested in the shark surface, or rather, its wireframe. Now, if you look at the wireframe of the shark surface, you will see that it has a really nice symmetry. Um, and you see that there's a fixed point right there in the center. And if you take length L and you tend it to both infinities, plus infinity and minus infinity, imagine if you, like, you're stretching the wireframe, then that point right there is going to be stable. It's not going to move. As you can see in the surface right next to it, it doesn't give us something that's trivial, such as just like planes. It's actually a very interesting surface that we can work with. Now, when I looked at this and I thought, well, it does give me the properties of it being periodic. And it's also minimal because, again, I use the wireframe method. Um, but it was not giving me the mod 3 property. And I was thinking to myself, how can I recreate these two properties and add the mod 3 to it? And then I immediately thought hexagon. So what I thought was I would try to recreate the up and down pattern, but using a hexagonal prism. And I thought maybe that would work. And it did. So as you can see here, I it was it's based on a hexagonal prism. If you look at it from above, then you would see the shape of a hexagon. Um, and also you can see that there are alternating rectangular up and down patterns. And that's something I stole from the shirk surface wireframe. Um, and that gave me the hexaprism wireframe. Using this hexaprism wireframe, which this gave us a lot of trouble trying to recreate this in Mathematica um, <laughs> in very, like, many, many days because we don't have parametrizations of these surfaces. But um, once we did do that, um, we can easily see that um, it is a minimal surface because we did use a solution of Plateau's problem. Um, it's also a non-trivial extension to both infinities. If you take, for example, um, L right here and you stretch it out, then it won't give you just planes. It would give you something very interesting.
of saying which is what we want. And also, um, it can be rotated, um, and like I said, stressed periodically in three directions, which makes it periodic. Um, and it gives us something like this. So as you can see right here, we have the three surfaces, and they're rotated along the standing axes right here. And we do that two times, just like for this picture right here. And you can see right here that this, I'm not tall enough for this, but if you see that like the intersection of the three surfaces, that gives you um, 120 degrees, and they're equal, and that gives us a Mach 3 property, which is very fascinating. And if you do that a number of times, and you look, look at it from above, then you would see this kind of tessellation. Um, and if you stretch it, then there you go, you just filled all of R3, which is really, really interesting. Now, let's look at other wireframes that work. Um, this is just another one. This is based on a triangular prism instead, and as you can see, it still has the alternating up and down pattern, and instead it goes on triangular tessellation if you look at it from above. Um, I guess that was it. Do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> That's how you should all be looking right now. That's all <laughs> Questions for this group? Did you actually build wire fr not frames in different inches so far? Yes. Yes, we actually did do that. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it's, it's very, very, it's not that hard, but like the sofa, sometimes it just won't work because we had to get closer and all that. All right. Good. But yeah, it was kind of fun. Yes, so did you actually end up with the parameterization of the, those minimal surfaces you were showing with the hexagonal prism or not? No, not really. So, so how did you end up drawing them? And... So me and Professor Kazros, we worked very hard on this in the past few days. And like, if we look at this one, for example, the top one is just, I, I found this very old forum that had a code for finding minimal surfaces. All we have to do is just kind of find a parameterization of the boundary. And I guess that's what Professor Kazros has done also. This one can, the one on the, you can see all the little triangles. Yeah. Yeah. They're many. Not so perfect. Yeah. Yep. So essentially, we just like picked out like, like if, we, if we wanted to parameter the boundary, like the wireframe that we would work with, we just had to like, like very, very small cones or like, I guess, triangles. And then the code that we had would turn it into a minimal surface. But you need, you need to have an initial surface. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much.